In this video, we will explore one of the ways on how bad actors can hide their traffic through legitimate services. This is also called living off trusted sites. There is this tool that will show you some information about this various tactics. We will explore one of them. As an example, we will see how bad actors can use GitHub as a command and control server. We will develop a basic implant that will gather data from the target device and send it to attacker-controlled repository. In order to do that, we will need to understand a crucial concept in Python. That is how Python import system works. Before diving in, let's have an understanding on how this attack will work. GitHub is a popular developer platform for managing various kinds of code. Companies typically include this on their firewall allow list, as this is a legitimate site used by many people around the world. That means any GitHub-related traffic is not blocked. This can be exploited by bad actors by hiding their presence within the legitimate connection. In this attack, we will make GitHub our command and control server. Then we will deploy a minimal implant on the target. Once deployed, the implant will connect to GitHub like any other legitimate traffic. It will pull the necessary modules that will perform the attacker-controlled tasks. Once the code has been pulled, it will execute and return the output back to GitHub as a normal commit. Attacker can now view the result and manipulate the commands being sent to the target in any way he want. Let's go back to our terminal to create our attack. I already prepared a GitHub repository, so let's use that. As you see, there is nothing here except for a readme file. Let's create our structure. A C2 framework consists of several tasks that can be performed by the implant. In this example, let's arrange them into separate modules and put them under same directory to keep things organized. We will also need some place that will store the results of each task. In ideal scenario, this should be located on a different repository to avoid sync issues during command updates. But for the sake of this demo, and to keep things simple, let's also put it on the same repository. Lastly, we need the code for our minimal implant. This contains the base code to bootstrap the attack. This should not contain any suspicious commands to avoid being blocked by antivirus softwares. Let's create the base structure for our implant. We need a function that will connect to GitHub and authenticate us. This will return a session object that we can reuse on the different parts of the code. Let's put a placeholder for this function. Then it makes sense also to create a dedicated class for the implant which will provide us different methods for the attack. We will bootstrap all those code under our main block. This is also where we will store the GitHub session object that we can reuse later. Before we end this section, let's quickly populate our code that will authenticate us to GitHub so this can get out of the way. We will need the GitHub 3 module, but I already installed this, so let's just import it. Typically, we don't want any output from the script as this will be noisy and will increase the chance of the implant being discovered. But for demo purposes, let's put a print statement that will tell us it's trying to connect to GitHub. We need a personal access token that will have access to the repository. You can easily get this under developer settings on your account. In real life situations, this should be obfuscated to prevent defenders from recovering it and gaining access to your repo. But we won't cover any obfuscation techniques in this video. So let's keep things simple by just hard coding the token inside this code. We now need to log into GitHub using that token. That will return a session object. But that is still not enough. We need to invoke the repository method to gain access to the actual repository by passing the user account and name of the repo. Now let's create our GitHub constants above. I will put a placeholder for the token for now and I will change this later in the background to avoid being leaked. I'll fix some typos before I save and commit. Now that we have our base structure ready, let's go ahead and develop our C2 modules. Modules are various tasks that can be performed by the implant on the remote target. We will not create a sophisticated module in this video. The point is to understand how these modules are being downloaded from GitHub and being executed on the remote machine. So for demonstration purposes, let's create a basic module that will display the content of a directory. As a general rule, let's also create a file called init.py. Then let's name the actual module as ls. Listing the directory contents can be done using OS module, so let's import it. To have uniform format across all modules, let's define a run function that will return a string object. Python doesn't enforce return types. This is mostly used as a convention, but in some cases it is good to have this. In our case, this will tell us that the modules must return a string object. This guides us by reducing the mistake of developing a module that returns the wrong type. Let's create a print statement for debugging purposes. Our function should return the result. 
that will be stored inside data variable. We can easily get the contents using list dir method, but that will return a list object. So let's format it by converting it into a string whose elements are separated by new lines. To make our C2 framework interesting, let's create another simple module that will display the environment variables inside the current session. Environment variables is a common place for secrets, passwords, and other confidential information, so it just makes sense for the implant to gather them as well. Let's name our module ENV. Like with LS, getting the environment variables can also be done using OS modules, so let's import it. Then we will follow same format of defining a run function and returning a string object. We can get the environment variables using environ method. The output is a dictionary which is hard to understand, especially if the data is huge. So let's display it properly by looping through each key and value. Then we will format it so each entries will be separated by colon. Finally, we need to do same thing by converting them into string whose entries are separated by new lines. Going back to our main implant code, let's populate the different method for our implant class. During instantiation, we will pass two parameters. The implant ID, which can be any string. This can serve as an identifier about the remote target the implant is running on. That will also keep the output organized by storing them on their respective directory. More on this later. And of course, we need to pass the GitHub session object that contains the required credentials to access the repo. Let's put some placeholder for now. Next method will run the module code that we will fetch from GitHub. So it is expected to receive the module as a parameter. Third method will serve as the entry point on our class to bootstrap the different methods. We don't need to pass anything here. So these are the three methods that will define our implant class. Let's now initialize the crucial settings. First is the implant ID. Then as we just discussed, we need to store the output on appropriate directory. So let's define the path. We also need a list of modules that will be run by the implant. We can modify our program in a way that allows the attacker to choose what modules to run, but let's not get too fancy at this point. Let's just run all modules for simplicity. And lastly, let's also define the repository session object. Let's don't forget to define the constant that will contain the list of modules we want to run. Let's go to the next method. When running a module, it is crucial for the attacker to know the time of execution. So let's define a variable that will show the timestamp in ISO format to be standard across time zones. All of the modules return a string object. We will capture it and put it in a variable as well. We are passing the module name in this method and we need to run it. If we were just to call the run method directly in this manner, we will have an attribute error. That's because the module we passed is a string object and not a module object. So in order to fix that, we need to access it from the module cache, which is inside sys modules. Then call the run method for that particular module. And we need to store the results under the path we defined a while ago. It will also be good to have separate directories for each module. Don't worry on how this looks like as we will see this later when we test the C2. Last step will be to create the necessary file that will contain the results and commit it in GitHub. We will use the timestamp as the commit message. We also need to convert the results into a bytes object before pushing. Last part of this implant class will be the entry point method. We will run the implant indefinitely. Then we will loop through each module and run each on its separate thread to avoid blocking calls. We will also put some random time in between. This makes the module execution appear random to the target to avoid detection. Let's now instantiate our implant class and pass some arbitrary implant ID and the repo session object that will give us access to GitHub. Let's run the entry point of the class. Before saving, let's import the modules we use so far. Now that we have most of our minimal implant program ready, the next question will be, how are we going to import the modules? You might wonder, well, why can't we just chuck it inside our main implant code? There are different reasons. If we were to include all modules inside the implant, the resulting code will be too large to manage with so many modules. Including all modules inside the implant means higher chance of detection from antivirus at the moment our implant binary touches the disk. If we have so many modules to baked in, the resulting implant will be so bloated with modules we don't even need. It might be hard to transport the implant due to its large size. If there are new modules or we need to update some of the module code, that means we need to redeploy a newer version of implants. Deploying implants is not as easy, so we might not be able to get that second chance. 
Having a minimal static implant deployed on the target reduced the risk of detection and eliminates the management issues we just talked about. So if we were to dynamically pull the module code from GitHub and store them in memory, how can we do that? In order to achieve our goal, we must understand how Python import system works. As per Python documentation and contrary to what we are used to, Python packages and modules can be imported from locations other than the ones residing on local disk. Sources can be anywhere such as network or other remote locations as long as Python can search for it. Question is, how does Python searches for modules? They are done by the importers. Importers are classes that implements the find spec and exec module methods. The role of find spec is to find where the module resides and returns a module specification. The module spec contains information such as the name and location. The exec module perform the actual loading of module. Having this knowledge, our next step is to create our custom importer that will implement those methods. After creating it, we need to append it to list of importers used by Python interpreter. That will tell Python to use our custom importer if it doesn't find the module anywhere on default search paths. Now let's go back to our terminal to create our custom importer. Let's name it C2 module importer. Then let's define our methods. First is the init method where we should initialize important attributes such as the GitHub repo session object. Next is the find spec method. Don't worry about the parameters as we will go through this one by one in a bit. Next will be our exec module method. This is simpler than find spec as this only accepts one parameter, which is the module. Then let's append the importer to sys metapath so Python interpreter can use it. Only thing we need to pass to our importer is the GitHub repo session object. Now let's construct our custom importer. Inside init, we need to initialize the GitHub session object. Since we will download the module code from GitHub and store it in memory, let's create an instance variable for it. During instantiation, we still don't have the module code, so let's leave it blank. Now for the find spec method, you see that it accepts several parameters. First one is the module name. Path determines how the module is imported in reference to a package. For example, if the module is a sub package, we will set the path like this. But in our case, we only have top level imports and there is no sub package inside. So we will just set this to none. Target is not well documented. It is used by the import system to perform an educated guess on how to return a module spec. We won't leverage that functionality, so let's just set this to none. Let's add some debugging statements. We need to get the content of the module stored in GitHub. So we will use a method from our session object to get that. The data returned is in base 64, so let's decode it. Finally, we will generate a module spec. There is a handy Python utility that can help us do that. We need to pass the module name. The loader will be just the instance of the importer. And origin will be the GitHub repository URL. Finally, let's return the module spec. If you notice we didn't use the module code yet, that will be used on the next method, which is the exec module. We need to tell the Python interpreter on how to execute or load the module. So we will just use exec function. First parameter is the module code. Then let's also tell the interpreter that it can access the module global variables inside the dict attribute of the module. The interpreter is not expecting any data return, so let's set it to none. There is one method we didn't cover on the slides. That is the create module method. When I was originally testing this code, I'm encountering import error. It turned out that I'm using a higher version of Python, which requires this to be set as well. It is used in creating the actual module object. As per library documentation, we can set this to none to tell the interpreter that we want to use the default module creation process. So we will just set this to none. Let's quickly recap how this importer will work. First, we will tell Python interpreter to use this importer if it cannot find the module on the default locations. At that point, our custom importer code will kick in. Python interpreter will look first for the find spec method. We will tell the interpreter to look for the module in GitHub, store the module code in memory, and return a module spec. Module spec is like a metadata that identifies the module. Once the interpreter gets the module spec, it will look for the exec module method to see how it can load it. Once loaded, the interpreter will create a module object. At this point, import process is complete, and we can now use the module. In this section, we will do final touches and prepare the implant. We will finalize our code by importing the module. In this part, we are looping through a module list whose elements are string objects. Python will not allow us to import a string objects. 
That means we cannot store the module name inside a variable and import it. A small workaround for this is to wrap our import statement inside exec function. Do note that this is a dangerous function and must use with care. Let's just use this for now to simplify things. If there is any updates on our module, we need to tell the interpreter to get a new copy of that module. That is done by doing a reload of the module cache. Let's add another debugging statement. And let's make sure we import some of the utilities and libraries we used in this code. Before dropping this to the target, there is one thing we need to do, that is to bundle this into one binary. That means even though Python is not available on the target, the implant will still work. The binary will include all local dependencies and other libraries needed to run the implant. This doesn't include the module code as it will be pulled on runtime and stored in memory as we just discussed. We can use PY installer to do this. We can do the same thing for creating Windows executable, but let's stick with a Linux target for now. There is a lot going on during this process. There are some linking and compilation happening in the background. After that is done, it generates a 64-bit ELF binary that runs natively on most newer Linux machines. Let's copy this to the target. I'm going to connect to the target and run that binary. The binary looks intact. It's time to run this. We don't encounter any error, which is good. The debugging messages here are for demonstration purposes only so that we know it's running successfully. In real situations, this will be noisy. So you need to find a way to pipe this to another channel to avoid detection. The random sleep in between module execution is working successfully also because we don't see a regular pattern. Now, if we want to check the results, we can just pull the updates. We do this inside our attacker machine. There are multiple results already since the sleep timer we use is relatively small. We can always adjust this as needed. Now let's go and check the content of the results. We can see that the output directory has been created and under that will be another directory named after our implant ID. Then inside will be the actual module directories. This keeps things organized, especially if there are multiple modules and targets involved. Let's check some of the output starting with the ENV module. We can see here the environment variables under the current session. If this is an application user that connects to a database, it will be interesting to see the DB credentials under this list. Another interesting information to see would be user credentials and secrets that are used to connect to various services. There are endless possibilities on what to uncover by just looking at the session environment variables. This is the reason why this information is very interesting to bad actors. Now let's have a look at the output of the LS module. Nothing too interesting here since we are just seeing the slash temp of the remote target. A better version of this module is to list the contents of common places that may contain confidential data. Examples would be slash root, home directories, or any directories where application can store configuration files. If we want to do modifications on the modules, we can just update it like any regular script. Once done, we can just commit it. Then push to the repository wait for a few minutes and pull the results. The technique we learned in this video is just one example on how bad actors can hide their presence within trusted sites. The implant code we created is very basic only and needs a lot of improvements. One will be to obfuscate the code. That also protect the GitHub token from being discovered easily. Another one is to allow the attacker to control the modules it want to run and so much more. A more sophisticated tool like this will be hard to defend. You need to have a good antivirus software or web application firewall. They must be intelligent enough to identify the malicious traffic patterns. This is something I want to research more so I can produce a video and share it to all of you. I hope you learned a lot in this video. Thanks for staying with me and see you on the next one.